I have a text this morning, but I can't give it to you right now. One of the most popular television programs at present is a quiz program which gives away fabulous sums of money for answering very difficult questions on a series of many different subjects. This past week, Captain Richard McCutcheon of the Marine Corps won the coveted $64,000, and the press reported that it's the biggest prize that had ever been won on radio or television. Strangely enough, the thing that brought this program into prominence and put it on the front page of the paper was a series of Bible questions. May I say that it was strange that that happened, and yet when you begin to think that back of that was the fact that we're living in a day when we have so many Bible illiterates, even in the church, that it was amazing to find a person that had a knowledge of the facts of the Bible. And then I think, of course, it was in line with the current fad of interest in religion, and as a result, why this program became prominent. Mrs. Catherine Kreitzer of Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, the grandmother, named the Twelve Apostles and gave the name of Alphaeus as the father of James the Less. She won $32,000. May I say to you, on our question and answer program, which we have on this very station, on Monday evening at 9 o'clock, we answer more difficult questions than that, and we have yet to receive a dime for answering any of those questions, and apparently I'm on the wrong program. My beloved, it's estimated that 35 million viewers waited breathlessly for her to tell if she would try for the $64,000 question. She expressed her belief that she could answer that question, but decided to take the $32,000 and call it quits. The press stated that the $64,000 question would never be asked. The public would never know what that question was, and as a result, Bible sales increased all over this land, and there have been those that have been very critical of that, that that's not the reason to read the Bible. May I say to you, friends, I rejoice in any effort that's made to get people to read the Bible, regardless of the motive that's back of it. However, many people bought a Bible not knowing when they'd be asked a question that might net them a neat sum of money. But, my beloved, the reaction of the mouthpiece of the liberal wing of Protestantism was indeed interesting. The Christian century was rather tart and acid in an editorial when it made this statement. If a lipstick manufacturer thinks it's worth $32,000 to be told the names of eight of the twelve disciples, or that Alphaeus was the father of James the Less, well, that's all right for a quiz program, but it does not represent the sort of knowing the Bible which has any deep religious significance. All it means is that people like to play games. The Bible is not a game. But may I say to you that the Bible is a game. It answers the questions that concern the greatest game in the world, the game of life, my beloved. And the fact of the matter is that the Bible itself asks a great many questions. You will find that some of these questions have been asked by man. Some of these questions have been asked by God. And you will find the answers to these questions in the Word of God. Have you ever noticed some of those solemn questions which are asked on the pages of Scripture? In fact, one of the first things God did for man when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, he came into the Garden with a question, Adam, where art thou? 
And it wasn't long till man in sin threw back this supercilious question to God. This was the thing that Cain said, Am I my brother's keeper? A good question, by the way. And then later on, on the top of Mount Moriah, father and son were there, and an altar was reared, and a fire was laid, and the knife was there, and the son Isaac asked the question, Behold the fire in the wood. And then he says, But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? May I say that Job asks a very wonderful question. How should a man be just with God? And in the book of Job, God asks a tremendous question, not only of Job, but every writer of geology today, and it's this, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? And the writer to the Proverbs makes declarations. You won't find him asking very many questions, but he does ask a very good one in the 20th chapter of Proverbs, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Who can say that? And then the Old Testament closes with Malachi asking a question, Will a man rob God? My beloved, the New Testament opens with the question, Wise men come out of the East. And it's interesting that wise men will be asking questions instead of answering them, and they say, Where is he that's born king of the Jews? And one day, when this one who was the king of the Jews grew up and began his ministry, a scribe came to him with the question, who is my neighbor? And when he was finally arrested and brought before Pilate, that Roman judge began to ask questions, and two of them are very interesting. One of them is, what is truth? And then he asked this other question that I believe every man must sooner or later answer, what must I do then with Jesus that is called the Christ? My beloved, it was Paul the Apostle, that brilliant religious ruler, that Pharisee who had been trained in the Greek schools and in the Jewish schools, probably the finest mind that's been on this earth. And yet the first thing he did when he came into the presence of the living Christ was, Who art thou, Lord? And then this man, a little later on when he was arrested for his faith and brought to trial, and finally appeared before Agrippa, asked him the question, still a good question, why do you think it's a thing that is strange that God should raise the dead? Why do you think it a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? It's still a good question, my beloved. And that Philippian jailer came bounding in and asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Then Paul raises a question that every Christian, my beloved, must answer sooner or later, and it's this, shall we continue in sin? And Paul answers it, God forbid. You'll find, my beloved, in the Word of God there are many more questions, many more important questions that we haven't even mentioned this morning, but so far I have not mentioned the $64,000 question. The questions that I have asked this morning, which the Bible asks, you'll find an answer on the pages of Scripture. But I want now to ask a question that the Bible asks. The Bible does not answer this question. You cannot answer it. I cannot answer it. The demons in hell this morning cannot answer it. The angels in heaven cannot answer it. The devil himself cannot answer it. Michael the archangel cannot answer it. And I'm not being irreverent when I say to you this morning that God cannot answer this question. God the Son has no answer. 
The spirit of truth that's in this world today has no answer. And God the Father this morning on the throne has no answer for this question. And it's a Bible question. It's Hebrews 2, 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You can't answer that. I can't answer that. God has no answer for that today, my beloved. And if there is a, an unpardonable sin today, it's this sin of neglect. What shall I do to be lost? Somebody has asked. And they gave us this answer. Nothing. You don't have to do anything to be lost. You are lost. You are lost. You don't have to do anything. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It doesn't say reject. It doesn't say blaspheme. All it says is neglect. That's all you have to do. Nothing. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Will you listen now to our text? We can give it to you. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. My beloved, that's our text today, and we have taken this for a very definite reason. We're going to begin a study in the Epistle to the Hebrews on Thursday evening, November the 3rd, when we change our Bible study over to that night for an experimental period. And so this morning we're, as it were, dipping into this grand epistle. It's one of the two great books of the New Testament, the two great epistles. This epistle was written to strengthen the faith of believers, to render them steadfast in the assurance that there is truth and triumph amidst the tears, the trials, and temptations of this life. These Jewish believers were in grave spiritual danger when this epistle was wrote, what was written. They were, they were in the danger, not so much of the fact of physical danger, which they were then in, of ostracism and of persecution, but they were in a danger, a spiritual danger, of hearing these great truths of the gospel and doing really nothing about them. And so the writer here throws up a great danger signal. And this is actually gives seven of them. And this is the first one, our text this morning. And his first thing that he says is, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. And the word for slip here is a very interesting Greek word. It really is a picture of a canoe or a boat drifting with the current down a river. And I think we could change it very easily. That would bring it more up to date. It would le lest we l drift by these great truths. Now, I'm not going into the, any of the matter of a boat drifting. I found out here last Sunday morning when I preached on that little ship on the Sea of Galilee that I probably broke all the nautical laws in my exposition. We have here some experts of the Navy, and I want to tell you, they certainly got after me. 
So I'm, I'm a landlubber, and I'm not going back to talk about ships this morning. You can be sure of that. But I want to say this to you, that the picture here is of a little boat just drifting down. And that's what he says here. We ought to give the more earnest heed to these things because we just might just drift by these great truths of our faith. That's the danger. And it's an awful danger that he gives here. The story is told that years ago a man was fishing above Niagara Falls. And it was uh, one of these warm spring mornings. Fish were not biting too well, and he became drowsy, and he just leaned back and took a nap. And his boat began to drift. And he drifted down to where it was indeed perilous and dangerous. And on the shore, men began, began to cry out to him. Finally, one man threw a rock and hit him. My, he became alive all of a sudden, and he began to row, but the current was too strong. And finally, someone got a rope out to him, and this man's life was miraculously saved just in the nick of time. He was just drifting. That's all he was doing, just nothing, just drifting. And he was drifting toward destruction. My beloved, the picture here is that. It's the picture of these great truths that are the anchor of our soul, and there's a grave danger of us treating them commonplace and just drifting as you would in a canoe on a hot summer day. That's the picture that is here, my beloved. And he's urging us to concentrate all our mental faculties. He's calling upon us to apply all of our energy to try to grasp the significance, to give the last ounce of our strength in order that we might seek to comprehend this so great salvation. And he says here we ought the more to give the more earnest heed. And the word is one of vehemence and with tenacity. We ought to lay hold of these things. My beloved, the grave danger today in our fundamental churches right now, I believe, is this. I believe that this is the danger signal we should put up. The danger is this, that professing Christians in these days are going to drop into low gear. Instead of going on, just begin to roll backward. They're flying too low today. When God has called us to a high altitude, we're, we're today we're flying too low for safety. And many of us today treat these great truths as if they were commonplace. They we just go on. of these great truths. And certainly I couldn't see why I should be concerned, and it looks like I'd miss out altogether. And I was bothered with it so much that I went to a man who had been at Northfield in those early days, Dr. Schaefer. And I said to him, did you know Dwight L. Moody's son that's in the, fe the Federal Council of Churches? He said, yes. 
I knew him as a boy at Northfield. I've had him on my knee a many a time. I said, why was it that a son of Dwight L. Moody was not converted? He said, everybody took it for granted that a son of Dwight L. Moody was a Christian. Everybody felt that that boy above everyone else would be a child of God, and everybody just let it pass and treated him as if he were. That's the danger today, that we treat this so great salvation that we have as if it doesn't make any difference. After all, our children have been exposed to it, our friends have, and we shouldn't get excited about this at all. My beloved, there is a grave danger of treating the gospel as a bit of casual news that's unimportant for us to make very much about, that it's just the, the ordinary run of earth's happenings, and maybe it may be important or it may not be important, but we'll work it in some way or another. My friend, don't you know that if this afternoon I got a telegram from down in Texas that my rich uncle had died in the poorhouse, and he'd left me a great sum of money, and out here a wonderful estate. My friend, do you think I'd take that as ordinary? I would come into this pulpit tonight, waving that telegram, saying, Friends, I got good news. I want to tell you about it. This is something quite wonderful that's come my way. And I do want to say to you, if I do get a telegram like that, I'm going to invite all of you out for dinner. If I do get that, you better come tonight. You don't know, but what? I may get that telegram this afternoon, and we will give you that invitation to come and be with us. But, my beloved, we wouldn't treat it as ordinary. May I confess to you this morning the gravest danger that I have as a minister today is to come into the pulpit and treat the message I've got as an ordinary message, as something that's commonplace, that it doesn't make any difference after all. There is the grave danger. Oh, sometimes I feel like I'd like to come down out of the pulpit and I'd like to walk up to the aisle and shake some folk and say, Say, aren't you going to do something about this most important matter? But don't worry, I won't do it. If I did it, you would think that I was a fanatic, or I was some sort of a religious nut. You may think that anyway, but my beloved, may I say that if we did that today, and I don't think maybe we can do it quite that way, we probably would not be effective, but there's one thing that's sure. This is tremendously important, this gospel, and it's tremendously important because the writer here says this, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, and what he's saying here is this, his argument it goes like this. If the word spoken in the Old Testament by angels was steadfast and sure, then the word spoken by the Lord Jesus himself is even more important, my beloved. Now, how exact and accurate was the word spoken by angels concerning judgment? Did everything they said come to pass as they said it was? You remember that one time... Abraham entertained angels unawares, and he had these visitors, and they announced to him before they left that the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were to be judged, and fire from heaven was coming down upon them. And after they left, Abraham went to God and said, Listen, Lord, there must be some mistake. 
These uh, angels certainly must be wrong. You are not going to let fire come down on the city of Sodom and Gomorrah because there may be fifty righteous people there, and certainly you wouldn't destroy the city. God said to this man, Abraham, the thing that those angels said just happens to be true. It'll not be departed from one iota. Everything they said, you can depend on it, will happen just as they said it. May I say to you, my beloved, that the law that was given to the nation Israel, it was given, by the way, by angels, we are told. It's quite interesting when you go back into the book of Acts, and I just want to turn to one verse this morning because we, we don't want to be tedious. Over in the seventh chapter where Stephen was defending himself, he made this statement concerning the law who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And you say, well, I don't recall the law coming by angels. Well, Moses said it came by angels. Will you listen to him in the 33rd chapter of Deuteronomy, the second verse? And he said, the Lord came from Sinai, rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran, and he came down with ten thousands of saints. Are messengers or angels, from his right hand went forth a fiery law for them. My beloved, that law that came by the disposition of angels, every, every breaking of that law to the minutest detail was certainly punished. A man went out one Sabbath day, and all he did was just gather up a few sticks so he'd be able to make a fire early the next morning. And that man was stoned to death because the law that came by the disposition of angels was followed to the very letter. My beloved, the nation Israel tried to break that law. God warned them through the prophets, you can't break it, you won't get by with it. And those people went into captivity for 70 years for one reason, for not observing the sabbatic year. May I say to you, that which came by angels was followed to the very nth degree. And when Gabriel told Daniel about these people and their 70 weeks up to the present moment, their 69 weeks has been fulfilled to the very letter, because that which was spoken by angels was steadfast and sure, my beloved, and it has never been departed from one iota. Now, what about the gospel? Will you listen to him here as he speaks in the second chapter, the third verse again? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now, will you notice here, my beloved, that the Lord Jesus himself bore testimony to the gospel? Even at the very beginning of his ministry, he said that night that to that religious man, Nicodemus, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he believeth not on the only begotten Son of God. He wasn't through. Listen to this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. That comes from the lips of the gentle Jesus. My beloved, if the word spoken by angels is steadfast and sure, don't you know that the word spoken by the Lord Jesus is more sure, my beloved, and you can depend on everything that he said? And then, my beloved, not only the Lord Jesus, but we're told those early witnesses. And that's the reason God gave to them signs and wonders, was that this gospel might be confirmed before it was written down. And they had the gifts in those days. And you'll find those men bearing testimony something like this. Peter stood up and said, There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He stood yonder before those men that were defiant and said to them, 
you will die and be rejected as a nation unless you turn to this Christ. And Paul yonder in Athens, speaking to those philosophers in Athens, said to them, Oh, I know in times past God's winked at your sins, and that altar that you've got even to an unknown God, I'm telling you about him. God now is commanding men everywhere to repent and to turn to him. My beloved, may I say that that word spoken by the Apostle, the Apostle is something that is sure today. And John, the beloved Apostle, who wrote in a language of love, said, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Oh, my beloved, if this morning, at this very moment, the top of this building should open up, and a tremendous light shone in here, and in the next moment an angel from heaven stood at this pulpit, and the angel would heal every person in Los Angeles. I don't mean he'd put up a tent and have the sick come to him. I mean he'd go to hospitals where the real sick people are, and he'd heal all of them. He'd heal them all in Los Angeles, and he'd perform miracle after miracle. And then this angel from heaven would say, I'm here to say to you that the Bible is wrong, that you can't escape if you neglect so great a salvation. I'm here to announce to you today that there is a back door you can slip in, and I've come to tell you about it. May I say to you, my beloved, and I'm not being irreverent this morning or blasphemous, I could look at that angel of heaven and defy him and tell him, let him be anathema, get out of here, we won't listen to you, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And Paul says, even if an angel from heaven declare any other gospel unto you than what that which you've received, let him be anathema. My beloved, this morning the word the Lord Jesus spoke, the word that the apostle spoke is sure, and this morning I want to just emphasize two things in closing of why this is so great a salvation. Why is it that God's attaching so much importance to this gospel today and to this salvation? Why is it that he says that you can't escape if you neglect so great a salvation? It's first of all because of the worth and the dignity of the person who first declared. And second, it's because of the work and the deeds of that glorious person Will you notice this very briefly? This one who declared it, oh, the worth and dignity of his person. He's higher than the angels. God never said of any angel, even Michael the archangel, or Lucifer, son of the morning, he never called him my son. But the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God on an equality with God, and angels worship him today. He's the creator of this universe we live in. He flung the stars into space. He's the one, my beloved, that created the trees. He's the one that made the mighty ocean. He's the one that lifted the mountains. He's the one, my beloved, that stands back of everything that's material, that's come into being. He this morning is sitting at the right hand of God. He's the brightness of God, the fullness of God. He's waiting until his enemies be made his footstool. He's coming someday in glory. He will establish his kingdom. He's going to receive the redeemed to himself, and in that day we are going to serve him. It's pleased the Father to put all things under him. All things were made by him and for him. The trees have been made green. They've been given branches because he likes it that way. The flowers have been made beautiful and with all kinds of colors because he wanted them that way. This universe this morning does not exist for spoiled children. It does not exist for you and me. This universe exists for him. You and I were created for him today. We were created to please him. This so great salvation pleases him. It's his salvation 
and because of who he is. We dare not ignore it. It's the way he wants it today. Madam Fuller, in London years ago, made the statement, I accept the universe. Carlyle, that brilliant Scotch philosopher, sent back word. He says, she better accept it. My brother, this morning, you better accept the universe as it is today. He made it. And he's made it this way because he wants it this way. And you and I today will not have our little whims carried out. It's his will today, and it's his will that not any should perish. He wants to save today. This is his salvation. My, the dignity and the glory and the worth of his person. And then, my beloved, the work and the deeds of this glorious person. He wrought out salvation on the cross by suffering. No animal in the Old Testament ever availed. No sacrifice could take away sins. It's not by the blood of bulls and goats. No angel was ever sent as a savior. No man could be a savior. Even Moses was called a deliverer. But all he did was get the children of Israel out of Egypt by God's power and by blood. He never did get them into the promised land. In fact, he never got there himself. My beloved, only Jesus Christ is a savior. And God saved in the Old Testament on credit. God never saved anybody back yonder before the cross except as they by the light that he gave to them, a bringing of sacrifice that pointed to Jesus Christ. And when he saved in the Old Testament, he said, I save you on the basis my son will pay the price. None other were worthy enough. None other was good enough. He alone could pay the price and let us in, my beloved. And then, may I say to you this morning, God's given more thought and more planning more of himself to salvation than he has to anything else. Scripture makes that true. May I say to you, salvation is God's masterpiece. It's the best thing that God could do. It's the demonstration of his love to the universe. Why creation is called in the word of God, his finger work. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his finger work. He made the universe, and as Dr. Talmadge used to say, he didn't even have to try. He today made the universe, and it's just like a woman tatting or crocheting. It wasn't anything. But when God was ready to redeem, Scripture says, it's the mighty bared arm of Jehovah. May I say to you, God had to flex his muscles. God had to give his thought. God gave his son. And my beloved, this salvation you can't ignore. You cannot neglect this salvation without salting God. I read in the paper several weeks ago about a boy by the name of Eugene F. Sutter, Jr., 22. He's a student at Yale University. There was left to him a $400,000 inheritance by his father. He got tied up in socialism, and he sent in this word through his attorney, I'm about to renounce my claim to my father's estate for moral and political reasons. And the lawyers who had charge of the estate took him to surrogate's court. And the judge handed down this decision. It's amazing. The insistence that as a member of a free society with the freedom of choice, he cannot be yoked by this inheritance against his will is supported by law. And he didn't have to take it. I wonder what his father, who worked hard to accumulate that estate, I wonder what he thought. I wonder what might be his feeling to have a boy despise what he worked for. My friend this morning, how do you think God feels when you turn your back on so great 
salvation? At least here is your question. You will have to answer it, and there is no answer. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Heard of a cancer patient here the other day who wouldn't go to a doctor. And finally, in a hemorrhage, was taken to a doctor. Doctor said, if this patient had only come to me when the cancer first appeared, I could have saved their life. During the war, I heard of a boy shot down. He got free of the plane, but evidently froze in air. He didn't pull the ripcord on his parachute. He could have been saved, but he neglected to pull the cord. I went to see a man in Pasadena several years ago. I had talked with him. He'd been to church many times, and he said to me, McGee, as soon as I get up from this sick bed, I'm coming to church, and I will make my decision for Christ then, but not now. Don't talk to me now. I left. He never made his decision, as far as I know, or he never got up out of that sick bed, but suddenly one night slipped away. How shall we escape if we neglect? so great a salvation. We pray, Heavenly Father, we do rejoice this morning in this so great salvation, and we thank Thee today that when we accept it, that we're saved because it is a so great salvation. It involves the death of Thy Son for our sins. Lord, we thank Thee for him today. Make him very real and precious to these who've lifted their hands. May they come to know him in deed and in truth, whom to know a right's life everlasting. And then, if here or listening in, this morning there have been others that have not turned to him, O oh God, bring upon them a spirit of disturbance until they find in Christ that peace and salvation that he gives. For we pray in his name. Amen.